I welcome everybody to this uh, joint partnership between the World Economic Forum and Bloomberg. Now, my name is Rashad Salamat. I'm a pres uh, presenter uh, in Hong Kong for Bloomberg Television. And um, every day I get a welter of information, different bits of economic data, which are really hard to put together. And hence, we've got this question, you know, what is going to be the next economic crisis? And how are businesses, our businesses and governments actually ready to deal with it? Now, to answer that question, I'm joined by... Yoshi Miyayachi, he is the chief executive and chairman at Oryx Corporation. Peter Brabak, who's chairman and former CEO at Nestle. William Rhodes is a senior advisor at Citi. And last and certainly not least, Simon Henry, who's the chief finance officer at Royal Dutch Shell. So I'm going to start off with Yoshi here, who's going to talk to us about, well, that question. What is going to be the next economic crisis? And are businesses and governments ready mm -hmm. to deal with it? Yoshi. Good morning. I think uh, we are already in the midst of a long-term recession. Uh, I remind, uh, remember what happened in Japan. Uh, bubble burst uh, at the end of uh, 1990. Since that time, Japan is uh, having a long-term recession, and we have not covered at all at this moment. Well, during that time, Japanese government made a big effort to, put, uh, uh, to create uh, demand by, uh, by public spending. And uh, we could not make any uh, additional demand created by the uh, private sectors. So we have a prolonged deflationary trend for the last uh, 15 years already. So I. I remember what happened two years ago at the Lehman crisis. I think that everybody had a big shock. And uh, especially in Europe, US, and Japan, now, uh, in the, like following the Japanese ex experience in 1990s, uh, this is a s some starting point of the long-term recession. This is a very, very uh, difficult time for the industrial nation. Good part of the, uh, this time is that uh, we are growing sector in the world, especially in Asia, uh, so that uh, those uh, depressed economy uh, have ability to tie up their uh, next step uh, of the growth of those Asian nations. So this is a big question, and uh, uh, the, I think private sector have a uh, big role uh, to facilitate uh, Tie up of two types of economy. Peter Brabeck, where does the next economic crisis come from? And are businesses and governments ready for it? Well, if you allow me, 2008, we had three F crises, if I remember. We had the finance crisis, we had the fuel crisis, and we had the food crisis. Out of those three, for me, one is solved, which is the fuel crisis. I think we have leveled out at the price, which has a good, reflects a balance that we have between demand and supply. So I would say this one is more or less settled for the next couple of years. But the other two crises, the finance crisis and the food crisis, we have not settled. So I'm not looking for what is going to be the next one. I would like to see that we are starting to tackle this one. The food crisis, absolutely not tackled. And you have seen the reaction straight away by now, we have again the second food crisis in a short period of time, prices climbing, speculating, getting into the market. We already heard politicians saying that the first priority is to tackle the speculative part of it. But the reality is that while we are not tackling the root causes of the food crisis, which are declining productivity, which are the incentives for, for biofuels, which creates an increased demand in a sector which is already stressed. As long as we don't take this tackle, we are not tackling those root crises, root causes, we will not tackle the crisis. So we will continue to have a big food crisis, which affects, by the way, more the poor people of this world than any other of those crises. And the second one, the finance crisis, again, I don't think we have really tackled the problem because the finance crisis was nothing else but the result of a long looming debt crisis. Private household debt, which increased substantially. Private household debt in countries like Denmark, 
increased to 140% of GDP. Nobody even talks about it. Okay? The, the public crisis, we constantly are being confronted with the alarming figures for the explicit debt. Well, those alarming figures of explicit debt are nothing compared with the real figures of the implicit debt, which is basically the public liabilities which are related to aging of the population. They are hundreds of percent of GDP. And as long as we are not tackling those things, we will continue to linger on with post crisis for many years to come. William Broads, again, the next crisis. <clears throat> well, I, I believe also that we're still uh, trying to get ourselves out of the effect of the so-called Great Recession. And uh, the whole idea here is to get the world back to sustained growth, which is the number one priority of the G20 heads of state, and also to do so in a uh, formula of cooperation and coordination, uh, both on the regulatory area, areas like the Basel III uh, Accords, some of which have come out in the last few days, and the Financial Stability Board uh, recommendations. But during the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of what I call financial fragmentation, where each country has gone their own way, which has impeded some of the capital flows that we've had. Uh, now, some of this is understandable because we were in a period of great uh, over-leveraging that got us into this crisis, uh, both uh, on individual financial firms, companies, and, uh, and governments. And so I think it's very important that uh, the G20 countries work together uh, and not try and do it individually, because that'll just exacerbate the problem. I think in the United States, we're in a situation of low growth, what I like to call stagnation. And it's not clear when we're going to get out of it. Some people think a couple of quarters. Some people think a year could be up to two years. And uh, so we're talking there about stimulus. Now, if you look at Europe and other, uh, particularly Southern Europe, uh, but other parts of, uh, of the EU, they're concerned about deficits. And so you, have, uh, you don't really have a universal agreement on which way to go. I have to say, in the United States, we're going to have to tackle our own deficit. We've gotten away with it because we're a reserve currency. But we're building it up uh, tremendously, and uh, we have to tackle it uh, in, the, uh, in the near future. So I think we kind of, the world's got to kind of get its act together, and I still see a lot of, of, of difference in the way of, of implementation. Long term, which is your question, what am I concerned about? If we don't do the proper uh, work on coordination, cooperation, uh, and lessons learned from this last crisis, I'm afraid we could fall in to a period of, as I said, financial fragmentation, and worst of all, protectionism. And we certainly don't want to have the legacy of the Great Recession like we did have in the 1930s, uh, a period of protectionism, because uh, this world survives uh, on a basically global uh, basis in the sense of everything is interlocked today. And uh, I have real concerns in this area. One final point I'd say, as an example of where coordination isn't working just on the regulatory side for financial firms, but also for the corporate side, we don't even have international accounting standards. Uh, in most of the world, there's the International Accounting Standards Board uh, formula. In the United States, we have FASB, which is much different. And as Axel Weber, the president of the Deutsche Bundesbank, says, if we can't get our act together on international accounting standards, how are we going to implement international regulatory standards? So I think we have a lot to do. I think this upcoming meeting in Seoul of, of the Group of 20 will be a very key meeting to see if the major economies of the world can get their act together as to where we're going to go going forward. Thank you. Simon Hendry of the next crisis, governments, corporates, ready? Thank you, Richard. I think the way the world, governments in particular, reacted a couple of years ago was uh, both quick and relatively effective overall in terms of stalling the, the potential effects. But we're now in a period where, as, as Bill suggests, we could face a period of stagnation. It's a question of what next. 
what the government's doing in two areas. One, it, one is debt, and I think there are different issues in different parts of the world because the developing economies came through the, the crisis so much better. Uh, so this is really a developed world issue about handling the debt. The other issue is regulation. I agree entirely that fragmentation could happen in areas like climate change, in areas like regulation of the financial sector, uh, and in our own space, in the, the energy industry. If there is fragmentation, that is like tying business down uh, around the world in a way that prevents us from reacting uh, in a, a positive, long-term, constructive manner and, and having a view, a long-term, stable view about the likely return on investments which are, in fact, long-term. I think businesses, generally, around the world, are in better shape than governments. I think there's been many companies have taken the opportunity to take costs out and, in practice, to rebuild the balance sheet. They are waiting to see where the world economy is going. Uh, in our own case, uh, I, I work in the energy industry, which is a long-term investment industry. The IEA states that we need around $1 trillion per year of investment in the energy industry, almost to stand still, to meet the energy requirements that we can see. I don't totally subscribe to the fuel crisis is over. I call it more an energy challenge on which the decisions made in the next, next couple of years at the governmental and the, the global level could make a difference and depending on the way those choices are made, whether the right incentives are there to invest for the long term could in fact lead to the next crisis. We cannot live without energy in the same way we cannot live without food. I'm going to just pick up a point and just throw it at you, which uh, William Rhodes first of all. As militaries always prepare for a future conflict, they often get it wrong. They don't know what the next threat is going to be. Isn't that the case when we prepare for the next financial crisis? We do not know what that threat is going to be. Well, I think that <clears throat> we actually have a unique opportunity here because the old saying goes, you never want to let a crisis uh, go uh, without something positive coming out of it. And I think the opportunity here is to learn uh, that you can't continue a policy of over leverage, that you have to have uh, international uh, regulatory and accounting standards that are adhered to by the individual companies, financial firms, but also implemented uh, universally across the board by, by the regulators. And I think that uh, we must remember that the G20 number one priority is growth. And I think right now investors uh, don't have a lot of time for the so-called developed world, developed uh, economies. What they're looking at are the uh, major emerging market economies, China, India, Brazil, Southeast Asia, because uh, they feel that these economies are more resilient and that they had taken a number of steps to actually cut back on their leverage going forward. So I think that uh, if we do the right thing, uh, it's like the Mandarin expression, Wei Ji, crisis opportunity. We've had the crisis. Now we have to produce the opportunity to, to uh, basically learn these lessons and move, move forward. Our Japanese colleague mentioned very, <clears throat> I think, correctly uh, that Japan went through a tremendous crisis, their so-called lost decade in the 90s. And I think there's a lot for all of us to learn from what was done incorrectly and what was done correctly in the case of Japan going forward. Yoshi, and that point to you as well, I mean, Japan has regulated, many people have said it's over-regulated, and what mm -hmm. Simon was saying there, there's a danger that that kills off the entrepreneurial and the creative spirit. Well, I don't know if uh, Jap Japan today is uh, over-regulated or not. I think uh, Japan is, uh, I think, uh, deregulated uh, quite a bit of the systems in the last uh, 10, 15 years. But uh, what the Japanese government did was uh, how to create uh, I mean, uh, fulfill the gap in between the supply and demand. And uh, government thought that is a responsibility of a government to, to f fulfill this gap by, uh, by huge amount of spending. Now our debt is uh, 200 per, over the 200% of GDP. And the government and also the people now understand we cannot do uh, the same thing in the future, no, no longer. 
so that the uh, only thing uh, government could do is uh, to stimulate the uh, uh, private sectors and uh, to private sectors uh, companies for individual com uh, company I think uh, solution is quite different from a uh, nation because uh, individual uh, company can find out a, a new frontier in Asia so that I think Japanese big big companies now uh, coming into the Asian uh, growing sectors but which will uh, leave the Japanese people without uh, uh, additional value added uh, uh, GDP's uh, additions. So that uh, I think uh, now the term is uh, how government would guide the uh, Japanese nations as a nation. Uh, that is, uh, I think, uh, government responsibility. To the, to the, I think government could uh, deregulate further uh, Japanese uh, economic systems and stimulate to create uh, domestic demand. And also, uh, they can uh, stimulate uh, uh, to grow uh, new industries by having utilizing the uh, limitation of uh, natural resources. For instance, uh, CO2 limitations is uh, maybe if we have a higher standard than the other nations, then uh, which will introduce uh, new uh, innovations uh, would, would be uh, good for the, for the industrialized uh, companies. So that the government uh, uh, task at this moment, I, I believe, is uh, how to stimulate uh, private sectors and uh, to create a new demand. Simon, I'm going to bring you, because bring you in on this idea of trying to build risk resilience in, if you would. Is it a mistake? Well, what should be done? And what about the dependence or inter interdependence between business and government? The, one of the dangers going forward, I think, is, if you like, politics in the West, the need to do something as a reaction to what happened. And you, you, you refer to closing the gate that was open in the past, but not really seeing where the next problem uh, goes. I think the... the Western governments in particular, they can see what the longer term issues are and they, they want to work with business, but it's, it's sometimes quite difficult politically to make, make that move. Uh, and I, there's a very pertinent example in my own industry at the moment is what will the regulatory reaction be to the, the incident in the Gulf of Mexico? Uh, will it be one that, that says we have acted as a government or will it be one that says here is an appropriate regulatory regime for responsible development of a hydrocarbon resource in the future? Uh, and I think in that discussion, there needs to be an appropriate um, um, debate about risk identification, tolerance for risk, both of governments, of business, and of society, uh, and an, an acceptance that in any business activity there is risk. There is some risk, whether it's financial risk or, in, in that case, operational safety risk. Uh, and, and a more adult discussion about risk, particularly in the West, we, we, we sometimes have reach the point where we have to remove risk. And we feel that uh, all, or, or, all activities that we undertake should be risk-free to the extent that we stop doing activities. And I think there is a danger now of that happening. That could lead to much longer-term issues. Uh, and I'd like to think that the discussions we have, if you like, behind closed doors with the government are, are lifted into the public domain in a way that encourages the public to think and therefore governments to think about the right balance. Peter, what about you? What, what's your take on this, this <clears> side of things? I mean, you've been writing furiously there. So. Well, I think um, what Bill mentioned before, if really the primary objective of the G20 is to get growth, there would be one measure that they could adapt immediately, and this would be to get an end to the Doha round. Because the big, the big difference between low growth and depression is protectionism. So, very clearly, if you want to set one clear sign to the world that the danger of protectionism is not there, would be signing the Doha round. So that would be my first clear recommendation, because it would give a clear sign to the, to the economy that we really believe uh, that we believe in the free market. The second one is this regulation 
uh, spree that we have. I agree that the finance sector needs more regulation. But I do not agree at all that the rest of the economy needs another set of thousand pages of regulation. I remember when the Enron case was, the outcome was politicians wrote 9,000 pages of additional regulations. And at that point of time, I said, you are going to see this regulation reflected in the productivity of the economy. And you saw it reflected. Because when you turn around the society from a creative, innovative society, which is willing to take certain risks, into a compliant society, the one thing that is going to be losing out is productivity. And if there's anything that can get an economy growing, it's a productivity of its economy. It's not stimulus and increasing further on the debt. I just looked at the figures because uh, the, the USA, and those are the figures of the Bank for International Settlement, so the most serious one. The United States, if they go on with what they are doing up to now, are going to have in 2040 a deficit of 430% of GDP. Okay? 430%. This is the United States. And do you think with the stimulus package you are going to avoid this? I don't think so. William, I mean, you, you really do. <clears throat> the, the leverage is the biggest problem right now. Well, I think the, the point, first of all, let me comment on Peter's point on the door round. I think he's exactly correct. We get a lot of rhetoric starting in the Washington G20 about door round. We have in each one of the meetings, but we haven't seen a lot of progress. And I think uh, when we talk about protectionism, you know, the door round is, is obviously very important because it's basically the way uh, out of that. Uh, I think as far as uh, uh, another point was made on jobs, the private sector has got to be the key driver on jobs. Uh, you can only do so much with government stimulus. And, it, and, and what that means, you've got to have confidence in the private sector uh, to invest. You can't have uncertainty. And uh, on the question of regulation, which ties into all of this, I'm a believer in smart regulation, not over-regulation. Because I think the points made about you know, piles and piles of regulation, they don't mean very much if they're not adhered to anyway. And so I think the correct way is smart regulation that's properly regulated uh, and implemented by both the individual companies and the regulators. The other thing which feeds into this, which is your question initially about what are the problems going forward. I spent a decade and a half, I guess, working with the developing world on restructuring their debt. And they made a number of very important uh, uh, economic changes and reforms. And so when the problems of Southern Europe came up, and countries like Brazil, I could run through a number of them, they came to me and they said, Bill, uh, you know, we did all of this in the 1980s and 90s, and uh, we were preached to by you Americans and the Europeans and what to do, and now we take a look at what's going on, and uh, none of what you preach to us is adhered to in the sense of, of the question of deficits uh, and other <clears throat> problems that occurred, but mainly the building up of these uh, tremendous deficits and over-leveraging. And so I think uh, the deficit problem, as just mentioned by Peter, uh, <clears throat> is not isolated to Southern Europe uh, or the UK or anywhere else. It, uh, it's a major problem for the US, and it has to be tackled longer term. Uh, Short term, we have to get over some of the problems we have on getting, uh, getting out of stagnation. But uh, medium term, we have to tackle this. And at the end of the day, the developed world is finding that they're no different from the developing world. And so you can't say there's one set of rules for the emerging market countries and another set of rules for the developed world. There's got to be one set of rules. And supposedly, that's why we have the G20. And we'll see what. Uh, what comes out of these meetings in Seoul. Yeah. Well, how does it all shake down, Simon, here? I mean, we've got the G20 coming up. What does the world look like in five years' time from now? And we are sitting, obviously, in the world's fastest-growing economy. 
I think what we have seen over the past few years is an acceleration of that shift in not just industrial capacity, but also technology development, investment in the future, away from the developed world to the developing world. And we put roughly 40%, 50% of our total investment now into Asia and, and South America. So China, India, Brazil have taken an increasing share of the world's uh, economic activity and they're, they're almost now having to come to terms with what do we do with it? And, and this issue about resources, we go back to, again, your original question, it is clear that long-term thinking about security of access to resources, not just energy resources, but minerals as well, uh, is driving thinking in, in, say, a country like China, but also India. And the implications there, that long-term approach, relative to, say, the developing world, which uh, is, is still coming to terms, I think, with not just the implications of the financial crisis, but climate change. It's a very different place in the agenda, particularly for the energy industry. And some of the choices that are being made are not always based on the science or always based on the economics. So we've got, as a, if you go forward five, ten years' time, some of the choices being made now in terms of access and security of resource on the one side and uh, uncertainty about the long-term framework of where, where investment should go could create tensions that we see, if the wrong decisions are made now, could lead to uh, uh, the next crisis. Uh, Peter, how does it shake down? I know you've got a couple of points to make when it comes to the right decisions being made now. That's for certain, isn't it? Well, first of all, I would say I don't understand how we can continue to talk about developing countries when we're talking about China. Okay? I mean, the governor of California was just here in order to buy Chinese technology to to build a, a high-speed train from, from San Francisco to, to, to Los Angeles. Uh, normally, uh, you think that it is a developing country which is buying from the developed country. So I would say the U.S. seems to me the developing country and China is a developed country. I mean, uh, that doesn't make a lot of sense, okay? Uh, we discussed with the prime minister about the change that is happening from made in China to created in China and serviced in China. Well, once you are there, and I think that's where China is, I, I cannot call this a developing country. Okay? So I think that's the first remark I would make. I think this is an old, an old thinking which is over for me. That's gone. Uh, the second issue is, if you ask me about the next five to ten years, what are the biggest challenges in general? I would say the biggest challenge is how we are able to supply this growing population with adequate food and with adequate energy. In both cases, we have a deficit of about 30 to 40 percent in the upcoming years. And for both, and the solution for both, you need water. That's the most important resource. Because the future energy sources are basically extremely water intensive. We will need four liters of water to produce one liter of oil when we go into the oil sands. Okay? We need one liter of water in order to produce one calorie if it comes from the food consumption. If it comes from a plant, we need 10 liters of water if it comes from meat. <coughs> the demand on the water resources is going to multiply. And we are already overusing today the water in an irresponsible manner. That's going to be, for me, the biggest issue that humankind has in the next five to ten years. If we do not solve this problem, we can forget about climate change. You know, whether in 100 years the glaciers of the Himalayas are going to melt down, very nice. Very nice. But this is 100 years by now. If we are not solving this problem, the water problem now, and immediately, we will not have to worry about all the other problems we are hearing today. Yoshi. Five years from now, I think uh, most of the developed nations uh, will be staying still, uh, very quiet, uh, no growth or uh, maybe some minus growth. Uh, versus uh, developing nations, including China, uh, will continue to be vast, vast and also uh, it become a, a real center of the uh, growth of the entire world. 
but at the same time, uh, maybe question uh, become more important if uh, this uh, growth would be sustainable uh, in the longer future because of the limitation of this uh, water, uh, fossil energy, or if you just think of uh, other kind of uh, food, uh, things uh, like food or maybe uh, CO2 emissions. So the world, uh, I think, will focus to tackle with this uh, new problem, bigger problem for the entire world. And also, uh, another concern I have is uh, a country like China has grown to, to date uh, by the, maybe close to the 50% of the GDP is uh, from uh, investment, uh, including uh, infrastructures. And uh, consumption growth is uh, relatively small. So if uh, developing nations could uh, grow further by investing further, uh, if they have uh, any returns by those investments, which might uh, uh, come up with uh, excessive uh, uh, capacity or very inefficient uh, type of investment for the entire economy. So maybe five years from now, I think sustainability of the develop developing nation is becoming a much, much bigger problem. Simon, anything in response to that as well, particularly when you look at the energy side of things? Um, I don't share totally the pessimism of, uh, of Peter. I think that I'm a believer in technology and ability. Uh, Some call him of, an optimist, of, you know that. Yeah. <laughs> The ability of, of companies in particular to, uh, or the private sector to develop responses to the challenges you highlight, for example, uh, agricultural efficiency or, in, in our own case, the use of uh, water in, in oil production. We, we can improve that efficiency. We know we can do it. It's a question of is there a stable enough framework, the right incentives to do it, and not the wrong incentives that are pointing in the wrong direction for, uh, that create the discontinuities that will lead to tensions. Uh, and then that, that fragmentation we talk about is something that worries us with different rules in different parts of the world in particular. I think if we, we, we look at oil production, just in, in terms of numbers, we produce 87 million barrels a day globally, uh, collectively. In the next 10 years, because of the nature of the activity with declining production naturally, we have to create another probably four Saudi Arabias through investment or 10 North Seas, and that is a very significant industrial uh, uh, challenge and technological challenge. Yes, I think we can do it, but if we don't address the right, uh, the right questions now, I think that alone, and that's really just to stand still, uh, not pick up the growth that some people see, if we don't address that now, then, then those tensions will, will occur earlier rather than later. Uh, and, Technology development, and I agree entirely with the point made, quite a lot of that is now coming out of what we used to call the developing nations. So in agriculture, I was in Brazil earlier this year, some of their technology in terms of monitoring the crops and your satellite technology is quite amazing, truly amazing. They are almost, uh, their, their water use is as good as it could be, tremendous. In, in China, the ability to, to squeeze the last drop out of the the, the reservoir is clearly well demonstrated as well by PetroChina. So some of the solutions will come from places we're not, you know, traditionally they've not come from. William, you were, you were nodding, William. Well, I, I think just a couple of points. One, because again, you're asking us about change. I think we're going to see uh, much more in the way of cooperation among Asian nations. Uh, we've, we, we already have the <clears throat> EU, and uh, you've had various ASEAN and other APEC uh, groupings in, in Asia. But I think you're going to see much more in, in the way of trade and development among countries in Asia. And that's going to be a major driver of the world economy, much more so than it is today. Specific, I'll be very surprised in a couple of years if we don't have a Northeast Asia economic bloc where the so-called developed country, I agree with Peter, so I say you can't say emerging and developing uh, developed anymore. Uh, but I think you'll see Japan, Korea, and China have a Northeast Asian economic bloc, which will be a powerhouse uh, given the, uh, the potential there. Uh, and uh, in the case of China, we always think of China as, as, as the great exporter. 
but I think the government is taking steps and the population uh, wants it where you're going to see China develop much more rapidly on domestic consumption and domestic demand in, in uh, the next five years than we could have dreamed of. Just like when Deng Xiaoping gave his, his speech in Shenzhen in 1992, who would have dreamed that China would be where they are today? I predict in five years the domestic consumption rate of China is going to be way ahead of any of the projections that we see today. A Northeast economic bloc here, Yoshi. Well, I Northeast think, Asian, I should say. Mm -hmm. I think this is a very good idea, and uh, especially in between Japan and Korea, I think we can, uh, there's a lot of room to tie up. And I always think that North, uh, Korea and Japan and China uh, are not competing each other. I think uh, each country has a, a sort of a complementary uh, location, situations, because uh, China is a huge market for those uh, two countries, and Japan and Korea can uh, supply uh, high technology and also the, uh, lots of uh, developed uh, software type uh, network, and also the uh, various service industry have uh, uh, new tech new technologies that we can, I think, China, uh, Chinese people uh, like to uh, buy from those two countries. So I think uh, uh, your idea of having uh, three countries have uh, one unity in the coming three, five years would create a very uh, good uh, size uh, uh, economic uh, territory, uh, which can be a, uh, could be a uh, growth center for the uh, other part of the world. Peter, and, and free trade, obviously, and protectionism, with notwithstanding, where does a Northeast Asian economic bloc leave the United States? Where does it leave Europe as well? Well, I think uh, when I look out uh, into the future, I'm not uh, overly pessimistic, although it might sound because I'm stressing out some of the fundamental problems. Because I agree with Bill, I think uh, we have some growth engines, uh, China being certainly the most important one, but I still believe that the surrounding countries uh, are, will have and will deliver good growth. I mean, if I look at least in our business, the consumer good business, there are several countries around here where we have high double-digit growth, and, 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 and I don't see that this will go away for in the near future. Uh, I think India and the surrounding is also another area Africa, Middle East, I mean, the, all these regions, I see very good growth opportunities, uh, Africa being one which is accelerating very much, and within Latin America, you have a mixed uh, picture, depending a little bit uh, on the countries and the governments that you have. But, but overall, I would say there is quite a good opportunity uh, for growth coming. Where I see a little bit more difficult the situation is in the United States, Although I believe that in the United States there will be a slow, you would say, slow growth, uh, I would say somewhere between 1.5 to 2 percent over the next couple of years, not more. I think it will be longer. I don't think it is a, qu a quarter, two quarters, or three quarters. I think that's something that will stay for a longer period. And in Europe, overall, I think we are in for a very tough time. Because the public debt is there, and because we are starting to bring down the private debt, and the third factor is, which is another stunning factor, that at most part of our population have the disposable income coming from state. Okay? So if you look at the share of the population, where the public resources accounts for more than 50% of the disposable income, in Sweden, it's now 55% of all private income comes from the state, okay? In Denmark, it's 50%. In the United Kingdom, it's 35%. Now, if you have such an indebtedness, public indebtedness, where do you want to get these resources to continuously pay? This is the active part of the population. Think about the pension liabilities you have and things like that. So I, I, I just cannot see where we are getting the funds in order to create consumption in Europe. Okay? That will be a big challenge for Europe, to bring this debt down. 
In the United States, it's less. If I look at the United States, it's not even, it's about 20%, okay? So the personal consumption has more opportunities in the U.S. to recover. That's why I'm more optimistic about the U.S. of 2%, something like this, while they diminish their public debt. Europe is going to be in a big crunch. There will be the exception for those who are export-oriented, of course. But, you know, if you look at all of Europe, this is just one or the other exception, and the rest has to see how it can create internal consumption. So I think we'll ask the audience what they're making of it, and we've got a few hands coming up as well. If you just state your name, the organization you come from, and uh, who you'd like your question addressed to. Gentleman at the front here. Adam Mutambara from Zimbabwe. I want my, the views of the panelists to the views I have. I think we need to do three things to prepare for the next economic crisis. One is to accept that we've failed to understand the cause of the current economic crisis. I think productivity is the cause. In fact, we've given this crisis a wrong name. It should be a productivity crisis. Why? Because finance follows yield, and yield should be driven by productivity. But yield was being driven by toxic products in Europe and in America. Productivity has moved from Europe to China to Asia. So it's a productivity crisis. Secondly, we have failed to understand the nature of this crisis. It's a global economic crisis, but we're offering national solutions. We need global solutions. How can a national stimulus package in America solve a global economic crisis? After all, in 2040, China will own 40% of all GDP. America will own 14%. So wrong solutions to a global challenge. The last one is that let us embrace uncertainty. Let us embrace chaos as a way of life. It can't be business as usual. We need new systems, new values, and new institutions to address the next one. We are not doing that right now. Thank you very much. I think, William, you, you, you know well, what? I, I, I agree completely with the idea about the global solutions, which is what I was saying, which is why we supposedly have the G20. Because if we all go on an individual basis, we're not going to get uh, the problem resolved, and we'll just set the next standards for the next problem, which could be uh, even worse than the present one. So I agree completely with you on that. And uh, I think the duty of all of us is to push our leaders that they not only sit around the table and discuss, but then they go home and actually implement what they say. Should we accept chaos, though, that's one point the gentleman was making. <laughs> Well, it depends on what, how you define uh, chaos. But uh, if we can't get our act together, we just sow the seeds for the next, uh, the next problem. And I think uh, Peter very correctly mentioned Africa because I think Africa is, is, is too often ignored, and there's tremendous potential in Africa. And I think one of the drivers in Africa has to be to involve the private sector more. And I think if you can get the private sector more involved in Africa, you're going to see a tremendous dynamic there. And so I would say that we all ought to keep our eyes on the potential in Africa. Gentlemen, just here wearing the gray. Mark Zawalski from Russian Business Magazine Expert. I'd like to refer to the comment about Doha Round. I think what we've seen over the past like three years after the collapse of the round is the race of, of free trade agreements, especially in this region. And I think that means that most of the countries already gave up on Doha Round, and we should admit it. And actually, what we see is that countries are more eager to open up and to sacrifice when they feel that they compete with each other in this free, like free, like free trade agreement move. So my question is, uh, do you think that we can achieve the same goals as with Doha Round but just with this, this series of free trade agreement? And we need to be kind of realistic and, and and, and accept that this round is, is never going to happen. Thank you. Peter. No, uh, I'm convinced that you cannot achieve the same amount of growth uh, if, we, if we do not sign the Doha Agreement. You know, the spaghetti bowl of uh, bilateral agreements uh, looks very good when you look one by one. You know, one spaghetti is nice. But with the whole thing put in a bowl and then you get intertwined with the thing, the efficiency of the system is absolutely not there. So I do not believe that the bilateral agreement is a substitute for the Doha round. Gentlemen there with the glasses. 
Yeah, yeah. Hi, uh, Ravi Kane from RPI in the US. I had a question for, for Peter about this issue of consumer debt. Uh, so in the US these days, we hear a lot of people lamenting about the over-leveraged uh, consumer. And I was wondering if some of these concerns are a bit overblown. So for example, the cost of servicing the debt is not that high. And it depends on what type of debt you have. So for example, even at the pre-crisis mortgage rate, say it's 6%, right? Uh, at 140% debt to income, the cost of servicing the debt is, say, 8.5% of income, which is a third of what the recommended value is. So are some of these concerns a bit overstated? Is my... Yeah, I mean, um, first of all, um, it's difficult to oversave when you, when you have 130% uh, of GDP in private debt. Uh, so I think uh, you have to start to save. I mean, if somebody oversaved was basically the Asian countries, they have been saving. But if you look into the United States, where the private debt was above 100% of GDP, if you look at the Europe, which is this hidden figure which nobody really wants to bring out, that in most countries, private debt went over 100% of GDP, okay? it is very clear that the first thing you have to do is to unleverage. Like any business had to unleverage, the same thing happens to private. So that's, that's the first thing. We are a little bit helped today because we have an enormous special interest rate. I mean, interest rates today are so low that indebtedness doesn't play an obvious role. But just think back. And I think we will have to go to somewhere where we were once in the past. And think back if these interest rates would go to 7, 8, 9, 10 percent, you know? How the housing crisis would be looking if we had a normal interest rates? How this private debt would be looking? How the public debt would be looking? When you start to give 30 percent of GDP, and I'm not talking now Latin American countries in the 70s, I'm talking about what we call developed countries, okay? when they will have to pay 30%, 40% of their GDP in interest rate payment for the public debt, okay? What's going to look then, the situation? That's Peter, my question. Peter, I want to just bring it to Yoshi because, of course, Japan's experience here is that you're having <laughs> zero interest rates. Or, I, think, I think negative interest rates are on the table now, aren't they, as well? Well, Japan's case is, uh, I think, people are not spending enough they are still saving uh, because the uh, amount of saving is so uh, big. Government is, uh, they have a safe feeling that 97% of the uh, government bond is held by the Japanese nationals. Uh, so that the uh, government thinks that uh, would not uh, uh, go bankrupt. <laughs> uh, and why people save? And we have a good uh, social security system and pension system. But still people, aged people are saving for the future. <laughs> that is a very funny story. But I think if you have a deflationary trend, people believe that uh, uh, today's value is, uh, uh, tomorrow's value is more than today, so that you can just hold the money and wait to spend next day. So that, so that the deflation is a real key, key for the, uh, the save or spend. So I really like to have uh, some uh, inflationary trend uh, for the developed nation. We can inflate our debts away, couldn't we, Simon? That's an interesting question as to whether some of uh, certainly Western governments have an incentive to see moderate inflation, but it's clear that if that also led to higher interest rates, that could be a shock on the system that until private balance sheets have been rebuilt in the same way that corporate balance sheets have, have been, that could be the next crisis. Just a comment on the consumer debt. I think uh, it's fair to say for a decade and a half, the U.S. consumer kind of carried the world on its back, and we had actually negative savings rates. Now we're starting to see 4 to 6% positive savings rate, and it, we need a little balance of this in the United States. On the other hand, one of the reasons I'm so optimistic about the potential for domestic demand and domestic growth in China is they were up to 40 to 50%. And as you get a social safety net put in there, I think that's where we're going to see the, uh, the tremendous surge. 
But I think what's going on in the United States at this point isn't so bad because we're starting to get a little balance in there and start to get a little savings. And, uh, you know, in the long run, that's not so bad. But, I mean, the domestic uh, U.S. consumer will come back eventually. And the other thing I'd like to say here is with all the problems that we talk about in the deficit and the slow growth in the United States, over the years, one of the things I've seen is every time the U.S. gets itself in a major problem, uh, we always manage to get ourselves out. So no, never undersell the United States of America's ability to bounce back and come back. Hi, uh, I'm Marjorie Krauss, APCO Worldwide. Um, it's a global company headquartered in Washington, so U.S., I guess you'd say. Um, I just wondered, since you were talking about uh, global solutions, where do you think the political will is going to come from and the political leadership to do some of the, the things that need to be done to support the actions that you're all talking about? That comes on the day that the Ways and Means Committee is meeting to decide on what it does about China as well. Over to you, William. Well, I, I would just say it, it's an excellent question because it's one thing, as I mentioned a couple of times, to sit around a table of the heads of state and agree to do a lot of things. Another thing is for the politicians to go back and implement it and execute on it. And I think the one point of real optimism I, I have is I think a lot of the world got very scared because this Great Recession could have turned into another Great Depression. So I think while the memory is still fresh of what could have been and what was, this is, I think, hopefully the big driver to get some of this stuff done. And that's why, again, I point to this, uh, this uh, summit in Seoul, the first by a developing world, and I think we will really see if the seriousness and the will is there to implement and execute after that meeting. Simon, same question. Where's the leadership going to come from? I think it needs to come through the multilateral. The G20 essentially is going to be the big driver. Uh, the EU, North America, and if there is a, a North Asian bloc, that may help. But I would just observe that the European Union may be a single market, but it's not a single political system. So somewhere the, the strength of leadership is required to, to bring even the Europeans together, let alone the, the, the major trading blocks. So I think the G20 is, is probably where we need to start, and it will need good leadership, uh, particularly from the U.S. as the, the largest single player, and China to step up to take uh, a, a positive view about how to use its newfound economic power. Quickly, Peter. Yeah, there, I just want to put the positive note here. The Korean presidency for the G20 has for the first time invited the business community to be an active partner in the G20 uh, discussion. He has created uh, a big working teams. We just had yesterday a full day meeting on the preparation, how the private, and the private sector will bring in its recommendation to this thing. Once more, it's an Asian leader who takes into consideration the view of the, of the private sector so I think there is some leadership coming up. And even if you listened, uh, I think, to the Prime uh, Minister Wang, I think there were some indications that uh, leadership might come also from Asia, not only the economic one, but also the political leadership. And I think it would be good because they still believe that the free enterprise system can really improve productivity, which was rightly pointed out as being the big crisis, productivity crisis. So, in this respect, I'm a little bit more optimistic. I hope that we will achieve something in Seoul in this respect. The gentleman there wearing the headphones, just uh, taking them off. Peter, an ambassador of Denmark here in China. I think the panel makes the right distinction between the responsibility of governments and companies in regulatory affairs and economic activities. There are, however, issues like energy and climate where governments, of course, have the biggest responsibility, but where companies also would have a huge interest in a long-term predictable regulatory uh, international agreement. Does private companies do their uh, part of the game and really tell citizens of countries how important it is to get this kind of international agreements on energy and climate? 
and could you do even better? Henry would be a good place to start. The simple answer, I think, uh, if, I, if I get your question correctly, do we lobby governments and do we give consistent advice that global agreements are considerably better than, uh, than, than fragmented? The answer is simply yes. Everywhere, and I can speak for my own industry and all players in it, we need a global framework. We need cross-border agreements. Uh, and we need long-term agreements that give uh, a, a level of certainty. We can deal with uncertainty to a certain extent, but not in this particular instance because of the 20, 30, 40 year investment time horizons we deal with. Uh, and, and, and we generally have a good debate with the government. The issue is quite often then politics. Yoshi, very quickly, I haven't got much time. Well, I think the private sector is doing this uh, as a, as you said, uh, big effort, but at the same time, entire framework is still weak and soft, so that if uh, in, uh, world framework uh, is fragile and it, it hasn't uh, constructed completely yet, so that the, even the G20, uh, power of G20 is uh, weak. Uh, I remember the, when Japan was in a very difficult uh, time, uh, we could not find out a, any solution, I mean, uh, help or solution from the other part of the world, so that until a big industrial nation like uh, entire Europe or U.S. be in the very, very difficult uh, positions. Uh, I think the framework would not be strengthened. So I, I have a slightly uh, pessimistic view. Peter. Well, I think my view is moderately optimistic. Uh, as I mentioned before, the reasons why, because I think a big part of the population, if you take the amount of population, is definitely in the growth mood. If you look at the numbers, okay? The, all these places I've pointed out before make up about two-thirds of the total population. So two-thirds of the total population is in growth mood, and then we have uh, a third which is half growth mood, and another third uh, which is perhaps a little bit more struggling, and then we have Japan, which I fully agree, uh, due to, by the way, demographic factors, uh, it's very difficult to be very optimistic about. When you have a society that declines from 124 million to 95 million, it's very difficult to see a lot of growth, frankly speaking. So, but overall, two-thirds of the population is in a growth mood, and I think these two-thirds are going to prevail over the rest. So I'm moderately optimistic. Final couple of questions. Gentleman here. Oh, I'm a journalist from Chinese newspaper, the Time Weekly. Uh, you talk about the Japanese and the Chinese economy. Uh, someone argued that uh, the rise of Japanese yen in the 1990s and, uh, ended uh, the high-speed Japanese economic growth that we call the, the lost 10 years. And uh, I want to ask, what will happen to the world economy if the rate of Chinese yuan rise? And uh, are you happy to see it? Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, um, I can only t tell uh, Japanese uh, uh, story. The Japanese, uh, I, I think, difficulty, I, I believe, started from uh, 1985 at the Plaza Accord, where the, uh, we have uh, pressure from the industrial U.S. and Europe that the uh, Japanese economy and Japanese exporting too much so that uh, we should uh, stimulate uh, econ uh, domestic economy and also the lower the interest rate. And the government followed this uh, accord, and uh, we have a uh, booming economy in Japan, created bubble. So that uh, I think uh, international, those uh, agreement is very important uh, for the key for the, for the individual nations. Uh, so that uh, I really ha have a understanding of why Chinese government is now uh, trying to uh, peg, uh, continue to peg with the US dollars, uh, their currency. This is just my question. Final question, somebody very, very quickly, just here at the front. Thank you very much. I'm from cool6.com. I want to ask uh, one question. We have been talking about driving girls through sustainability. What's the most difficult for the current uh, the development of low carbon economy? Thank you very much. Um, who'd like to take that? We've only got 30 seconds. Uh, I think quite a question. Yeah, um, Difficult. I think you need to repeat it. Yeah. Yeah, can you just repeat the question very briefly? 
What's the most difficult to uh, development the low carbon economic? Low carbon economic. Okay, low thank you very much. The, the most difficult carbon. challenge for a low carbon yep. economy. 30 yeah. seconds. I think that's yours. <laughs> <laughs> technology, getting the cost of the technology required down. Um, just for example, wind power, roughly seven times the capital cost per kilowatt of gas. Solar is even less, uh, into, uh, le less economic today. So that's the, the key challenge, development and rapid acceleration of the right technology. I would just uh, add one. Seconds. I just add one point to that. I'm a great believer that one of these days we will solve the problem of carbon capture, carbon sequestration, vis-a-vis -vis the enormous coal reserves of China, the United States, and elsewhere. And at this point in time, I'd say the, the solution may very well come from China before anywhere else. I don't have time to wrap up because we're literally out of time now, but I'd just like to thank you all very much for turning up for this one and uh, just to thank Yoshi Miyachi, Simon Henry, William Rhodes, and uh, Peter Brabeck for their time this morning.